Hi, I'm Shakira McKnight, and I serve as the manager of the Mayor's Office of Youth and College Affairs. Welcome to the second episode of the LEAD Academy show. You might be wondering, why is there a different host? Well, myself and Josiah Paul will be swapping out places to offer you a direct and accurate perspective. And of course, Nork's youth is accumulated of women and men. So we want to give you that accurate perspective. On this episode of the LEAD Academy show, we will be hosted with two students from Shabazz High School. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Ladies first. Hi, I am KJ Shapur. I am a junior at Malcolm X Shabazz High School. Hello, my name is Nadir Williams. I'm a senior at Malcolm X Shabazz High School. And of course, our mayor will be co-hosting this show in every show. How are you today, Mayor? I'm good, good. Good. Are you ready for another episode of the LEAD Academy show? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So the topic we are exploring today is intergenerational community organizing. We will be joined on the second half of the show by members of the North Peace Agreement also. We're going to jump right into the conversation. My initial thought when I hear the term intergenerational community organizing is I think about passionate community organizing and passing the torch from one generation to the next. On a local level, I think of Mayor Baraka and how your parents were both passionate about community organizing and how that torch was passed from one generation onto yours. Because of the generational concept, you were able to expand your impact citywide by becoming the leader of the very city your father once joined, fellow community leaders in the protesting against certain injustices. Pretty soon, it will be up to my generation and upcoming high school students, such as our guests, Kezia and Nadir, to take on the leadership skills and responsibilities of our city. So Nadir and Kezia, do you both envision your generation taking on responsibilities of community organizing? I'll start with you, Nadir. Uh, I envision my generation to come together as people to solve and eliminate some of the issues in the community, such as youth employment, give people a chance to f know how it feels to be in the workforce and the work field. Okay. I envision my generation doing great things and building, reforming our city because we have great tools at our advantage, such as social media, we just a little tap, tap, boom. Mm -hmm. The information is out there. Unlike in the olden days, they had to travel a thousand miles on donkeys and cameras just to pass information. We also have GoFundMe accounts where we could gather donations and be able to help the community. Mayor Baraka, would you like to chime in on that? Yeah. She said donkeys. I wasn't on no donkeys. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. The social media is, is definitely, uh, uh, she's right about that, 100%. You know, you have the opportunity to put information out there and, you know, uh, you just have to be careful, you know, because social media, you know, can also uh, put wrong information out there. So we just need to make sure that we put in the stuff out there that people need to hear and see and, 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 and push it as much as we can. But you're right. Rosa Parks didn't have uh, social media, uh, not, not needed this Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They couldn't organize that way. They had to do pass out flyers and go door to door to get people to an event. Now, you can get on a Zoom and have 500 people on a Zoom, uh, you know, without passing out one flyer. Right. So are you either of you involved in any uh, community organizations within your school? Yes, I am involved. I am a member of the Leaders of the 21st Century. Okay. And just last month, we donated a thousand bags of toiletries to the YMCA shelter. Oh, that's amazing. Excellent. That's great. How about you, Nadir? Yes, I'm involved in a walk like Malcolm X Shabazz leaders where we go to elementary schools, talk to eighth graders, and give them advice on how to become a leader and making decisions on their own. Okay. That's so great. If, if students wanted to get involved in any one of those programs, they could come see you guys, right? Yes. Yes. Right at Shabazz. <laughs> yeah. So my next question to you guys, right? If either one of you could start a community organization, what is one problem you will focus on changing? I'll start with you, Nadir. Um, one problem that I feel that we could work on is our social skills okay. and learning how to talk to each other, communicate without fighting, without arguments, and getting our problems out there so everyone can get involved right. and want to help. Okay. How about you, Kezia? Um, I'll focus on the mental health because I feel in our community, people don't acknowledge mental health. They don't think it's a thing. And we really need reformation of mental health among us black people. Right. Mayor Baraka, right. as, 
as a young person, you were involved in community organizing. Can you speak on anything or organizations you were involved in as a young person in the community? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I just want to tell you two people, you're doing an excellent job. You know, the work that you guys are doing is awesome, first of all. And, uh, you know, what you talked about, communication, mental health, is, is right on the money. I was part of an organization called Black Near Force when I first came home from college. And uh, we did same kind of thing. We did food, clothing drives. We had a Saturday academy for young people, Oscar Miles, I mean, Court Street, different places like that. We had this at. <clears throat> we had Friday meetings that we studied all of the time. We had poetry events. We did all kind of things throughout the community. And we did participate in protests and marches and all that other stuff as well. But our, our organizing wasn't just about having protests, right? We were about community development. So we fed people, we clothed people, you know, we had classes, leadership development classes, all of that stuff we did in our community. And, uh, you know, these people are still my friends today. We developed long lasting friendships. Okay, before we end, I know these two beautiful students have questions that they wanted to ask you. So, sure. Kezia, we'll start with you with your special question for Mayor Baraka. Okay, what my question to you, sir, is what provisions have you put in place in sustaining the mental health of both students and teachers? Are there like hotlines they could call if a drastic situation occurs or emails they could get in contact with? And I said teachers because if they're not in their right mind, they wouldn't be able to teach students. I hope they're not in there not teaching <laughs> kids if they ain't in their right mind, that's for sure. But there are hotlines. There, there are places that people can call. Uh, you know, uh, even our institutions that exist here, Beth Israel has a, has a, has a hotline, so does University Hospital, uh, but the Shani Baraka Center on Clinton Avenue as well. Uh, there, there are a myriad of resources that people, especially now in the middle of COVID, uh, that people can call and get assistance, uh, talk, be referred to other kind of help uh, right now. So those, those programs do exist. Uh, we just have to make sure that more people um, make use of it because like you said, they don't think it's a thing, like you said. So most people, you know, even when I was growing up, there were people who we know needed, needed treatment. You know, we just, you know, they go crazy such and such. You know, we, you, you know, make jokes about it, but in reality, the people need help, you know, and, uh, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we, we think of it that way, but we, we need to do better at it. Uh, teachers have help at the school level, though. Do I want you to know that the district, teachers can reach out to the district uh, for help. They, they can do that. They have, uh, as part of the, uh, the, the programs that exist in the public schools, right? If, if they're feeling any issues, they can call uh, uh, down there, HR, and, they, and they'll give them support. They have to. Nadir? Your special question for Mayor Baraka? Uh, my question is, when did you discover your true potential to become a leader within the city of North? <clears throat> wow. Um, I, I think I'm still discovering that. But um, at, at the end of the day, I thought that, you know, when I was young, I always believed that, you know, I had confidence to, to believe that I could lead and organize and do the things that I was doing uh, because of, you know, reading and studying and, you know, preparing myself. So I thought that, uh, I ran for mayor when I was 24, you know, uh, against Sharp James and a whole bunch of other people. You know, I, I got into debates and all that at 24 years old. So, you know, back then I thought I was qualified. At least I might not have been completely correct, but I thought I was qualified to at least get into the battle. And uh, the more experience I got, the more comfortable I became. And, and in, uh, examples of that, right, are the youth office that we have right here in City Hall, B3, where we would do leadership academies before, you know, pandemic. But now we, you know, have to stay social distance so we can't have that breakfast with Mayor Baraka and the yeah, students yeah. as we would like. So we ask beautiful students like yourself to come along and share your insight uh, from yourself and your peers. So that wraps up the first half of our show. Thank you to our first guests, Kezia and Nadir. Would you like to say anything or give any shout outs to any of your friends? Um, shout out to the leaders of the 21st century. You're doing a great job. Um, I want to give a shout out to our principal Gifted for giving us this opportunity to speak on this platform and Mayor Barack for taking your time out to come talk to us and give us information that we can take out to the world and Thank spread you. to other people. All right, and shout out to the North Street Academy, the North Community Street Team, and the Mayor's Youth Office. 
We look forward to seeing you for the second half of the show with the Newark Peace Agreement. I guess they brought me back for the second half. My name is Josiah Palm with the Brick Street Peace Collective. Now, before we even start, I want to talk to both these men right here. You know, normally they say Josiah, but my name's with an E, with a Josiah. So I just wanted to let y'all both know yes, that, okay? Sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> we got to bring some uh, laughter in this before we start. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's a difference in translation, too. Yes, Josiah sir. means Lord of Fire. Josiah means God gift. Okay. All right? I wasn't made of fire. I was made of dust, okay? <laughs> okay. Good enough for me, yes, baby. Sir. Two different people there, man. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so, of course, you already know the mayor's our co-host. I'm going to allow both men to introduce themselves, starting with the man to the right. All right. Well, hi, everybody, Don. Um, my name is Shadi Dukes. Um, I go by the name of Eight. And um, I'm actually the host of One on One with Eight, and I'm actually a community organizer as well. well my name is Brother Abdul Haq Muhammad. I'm the student minister of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for the Muhammad Mosque of Islam, number 25, which is located here in the city of North New Jersey. Cool. So for our topic, of course, you see in the first half, it was about intergenerational community organization. But we got both these men here to talk about the North Peace Agreement. So can you just please tell us what that is? Um, well, uh, according to the Gifford Law Center to prevent gun violence in New Jersey, they say that every 18 hours in New Jersey, a person loses their lives to gun violence. And they say that on average, about 482 people a year die by gun violence. But to be more culturally specific, they say that although black men in New Jersey account for less than 8% of the population, we make up about 70% of the victims of gun homicide. Then they said that in the same report that black men in New Jersey between the ages of 18 and 24 are 90 times more likely than white men of the same age in New Jersey to be killed with a gun. And they estimated that between 2013 and 2017, about 603 individuals below the ages of 25 lost their lives to gun violence. So when the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan came to the city of Newark, New Jersey in 2004 at the first peace treaty that was initiated, um, that was organized by the mayor and various other organizations, he said that peace with the righteous code supporting it produces love. So myself, Brother Shadi, Brother Byron X, and a few other brothers, we wanted to institutionalize a set of codes or terms that are practical and that are functional, that our brothers and sisters in the street could use, that will arbitrate and help to settle their disputes and conflicts without anybody having to go to jail or be killed. Okay, so now, if we just get a chance to just step back and look at this real quick, um, each of you represent a factor in society, political, spiritual, and social. Can you just explain each of you why you're um, factors needed in this uh, North Peace Agreement? Mm. All right, well, um, I start off and I say, um, I play uh, the social peace, mm -hmm. and pretty much I, it, I amplify, right? So my job is to amplify it and create a voice for the voiceless. And, you know, have uh, the opportunity to tell these, you know, these stories and these incidents and, um, you know, with, with, with a chance to uh, see each other for who we are and not for who they say we are. Huh. And that's our most powerful piece, you know what I'm saying? Communication rules of nations. So, like I said again, my job is to amplify, right? Is to, is to get the message out there. Um, well, the Bible says in the book of Hosea, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse, that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Then it says in the book of Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, the seventh verse, that as a man or woman thinketh in their heart, so is he or she. So the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has taught us that he who gives you the diameter of your knowledge prescribes the circumference of your activity. Carter G. Woodson said, whenever you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him to go there or go here. If there's no back door, he'll cut one out without having to be asked. So he also teaches us, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, that one of the things that separates man from beast is knowledge, because knowledge feeds the development of the human being 
so that we can grow and evolve into divine and become one with our creator. So it's not one's maleness, one's femaleness, whether you're black or white. Rather, it's our growth and reflection of knowledge that distinguishes us from the lower forms of life. So as a student and follower of him, then it is our duty to teach the uncivilized people who are savage. Civilization, righteousness, the knowledge of themselves, the science of everything in life, love, peace, and happiness. Yes, sir. That's the lesson. The, um, poli I mean, the, you know, politics of it is important because, you know, politics is really uh, the apparatus that, it, it, or institutions that are designed to protect uh, the, the things that we have, you know? Uh, you know, so ultimately people get that confused. They think politics is designed to get you what you want. You, those things are things you have to do on your own, right? It's like, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I, I think of it like growing up in a neighborhood, growing up in Newark, you could go, you know, as a kid, you could go buy new sneakers, you could buy a radio, you could get all these things. But uh, the politics of the community decides who gets to keep it, right? So you get to walk down the street uh, and be a part in, in, in the neighborhood. You know, sometimes uh, people tell you, you can't mess with him, don't touch him, do this. You know, people have relationships and politics help build those relationships. And uh, our job is to protect uh, the things that we create, develop uh, and give people access and opportunity so they can advance and grow. And so our job is to create a space so the Newark Peace Agreement can exist. Uh, that it can grow and it has resources uh, and that is not, um, you know, uh, attacked or shut down by other forces that, that, that seek to do that and will seek to do that. Our job is to make sure that that does not happen. Now, um, I want to touch on what you said. You said resources. Now, one thing we didn't touch on is economics. So my question is, what are the economic opportunities you are looking for in this peace agreement and how on the city side can we help in the aid in that cause? Well, um, you know, violence is directly connected to the lack of economics, locally and statewide. Uh, again, the gift of law center to prevent gun violence, they said that when you estimate the cost of gun violence in the state of New Jersey, it comes to a grand total of about $3.3 billion when you look at the pain and suffering, loss of economic opportunities, uh, criminal justice system. So when our brothers and sisters are killing each other in a city like North, it drains our local economy because now all of these different resources have to be used, you understand, to aid and assist, one, people who don't have no health insurance. A lot of them, a lot of the shooters don't got health insurance. You understand? So is directly related and directly connected. And if we can decrease the, the killing, decrease the crime, you understand? Then brothers like uh, Mayor Ras Baraka, he can do more, you understand? Because now he don't have to allocate as much money to the police, the criminal justice, the health care. You understand? So now he can take that money that we've been saving because the crime has decreased and then he could begin to do more in terms of equitable distribution. I mean, he's already doing a great job now, you understand, with the resources that he has economically. But if we decrease the crime, then he'll have more resources to do more for us, you understand, in the city of North New Jersey. Um, you, you touched on a lot, but I, I, I want to push this conversation. You know, um, of course, in the first half, you got to see young people talk. Now, I'm 24 years old. You know, I go into the schools I mentor, I go into juvenile detention centers and mentor. And I kind of, I really want you to start this conversation off and just say, what is the state of our youth? Like how, what, what, what are the things they're facing in the city? Like from your perspective and all that, what is the state of our youth? Well, it's a difficult time right now for all people, particularly young people, they feel isolated. You know, you're not, you don't get to be around your friends as much anymore because of COVID, all of this you can't go to school, there's no in-person learning. So it's a difficult time. And if you don't have a strong sense of direction, uh, character, support system around you, it's, it's, it's difficult to maintain yourself now. So, I mean, young people need a, a, as much attention now and, and help and support now than, they've, than they ever did. Uh, and so there are a lot of resources throughout the city, uh, but it's difficult even now in this time to get to those resources because of COVID, right? Even if you talk about the youth office or 
uh, classes or summer uh, camps, all this other kind of stuff. All that stuff has ceased, right? So uh, it's, it's a difficult time, you know, for to be a young person in the world today, in the city of Newark, is difficult, you know, especially in a city that's already starved for resources, you know, um, you know, families are already struggling, you know, um, to be in the situation compounds that issue. Mm -hmm. Right. So now, now you hear him say all this, right? And now we've got to, we kind of got to just push this a little bit more because it's, it's not the same. And we know that. And we see what you're trying to do with the North Peace Agreement. Of course, we're all eager and thrilling to help. But then I got to push it and say, our young people are so important and often left out. How are we including them in this topic? Are they the focus mm -hmm. in this North Peace Agreement? Yeah. And, um, and like I, you said, like, like yeah. you said, you want to push it forward, right? Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. That's always been the case, right? Mm -hmm. That we see with many organizations and when they, you know, is when you start grassroots and then as you expand, you start to disconnect. Um, we got the youth fully involved, right? So even when we did the peace agreement, we sent it out. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We sent it out to multiple different people and, diff uh, you know, incarcerated individuals, um, people from, uh, you know, different neighborhoods. And we also, uh, you know, we had the youth, uh, we, we sent it out to some of the youth and we had, we had, we had, uh, you know, the youth come in and sit down with us and even uh, read over it and we read it to them and ask them if they agreed. And they all, they helped modify it and tweak it mm -hmm. because we all know, um, you know, peace is a universal language, right? And although it's, although it's a universal language, what helps for this neighborhood might not help for that neighborhood because every, every circumstance is a little bit different. But what I'm saying is, we have full inclusion, you know what I'm saying, with the youth, because as we all can see, uh, you know, crime and violence and all that, it don't, it don't start with age, because once you, once you off the porch, everybody is the same age. Now, I'm, I'm pushing, like, you know, the focus on young people, because we do know it's centered around young people. Exactly. And, you know, like, um, from the Brick City Peace Side Collective, we have a diversionary team, and we do station house adjustments, referrals, so, you know, we would, I was just involved, you know, at the hub talking to like five young men who was involved in the stolen car incident. Mm -hmm. So like on this street, talk, you know, just to keep it real, like, mm -hmm. can we trust or do big bros have like that grip mm -hmm. on their little homies that's out here doing this type of stuff? So can we tr like, for those that are joining it, like, of course we know it's not, you know, um, you know, a mystery, you know, we believe in a, a spookism that's going to, uh, we say and they automatically want to shake hands and come together, but we still have to trust the protocols. Like, are there protocols put in place just to ensure that these young people are submitting to something that is universally good? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing is we all know the trust is, is shot right now. It's mm -hmm. gone, right? And it's, you know, because cause structure was was dismantled in this place and was left in a stage of, in, in a state of chaos. So what we're trying to do is bring normalcy back. And within that, we're gonna have we gonna have trials and tribulations that's gonna come with that. Like we're gonna have push offs and but we understand we are the people. Right? We are the people. We know who we're dealing with. We we understand the issues and we just meet we just meeting the youth where they at. We're not trying to talk above them. We're not trying to tell them you know, we're not trying to talk down on them. We're trying to meet them where they at and, 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 and hold their hand and walk them through the process. Because we all, we all been there at some stage or form in our life. Where we was, even if not a, even if not a youth, we, were, we all started at the bottom somewhere. We all was a youth at some point. We all didn't start at the top. So we understand it. And that's why the peace agreement is what it is because it's, it's made for the people by the people. And if I could just say, Brother Josiah, it, it's not as bleak and as grim, mm -hmm. you know, as people would like to paint it. We know that violence is the lowest that it's been in North mm -hmm. in, in the past few decades. Um, a report and a study was done and it showed that 80% of the city don't experience a violent crime, that 
violence is segregated to about 20 percent you understand of the city of north new jersey and then in the same report it was saying that 62 percent of the crime is only done by four percent of the population so it's not as bleak and as grim as the narrative is a lot of times told um our young people are very talented they're very brilliant you understand and um they've been doing a great job in um I would say reconciling and settling their differences, but a lot of times we don't settle on that part. We settle on the negative side of things. You understand? So I just wanted to, to put that out there that, again, um, various organizations and institutions have been working in cohort with the police, the, the, the mayor, different organizations, anti-violence coalition, Brick City Peace Collective, North Community Street Team. So a lot of great and good work have been done because nothing happens in a vacuum. So if the violence is down, it means that some work is being done and that some people are waking up and they're getting the message. So I just want to credit our young people for all that they have done in stepping up and coming to the table. But the question that you asked, it calls for speculation. I can't say what the big homies have or don't have. And in every organization and institution, you're going to have zealots. You're going to have rebels, people that's not going to hear, people that's not going to listen. You understand? That's natural. You follow me? But again, we just want to decrease those type of things and increase, you know, us following the protocols and guidelines. So. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good to hear. That wraps up our time for today. I would love to push this conversation, but we're on limited time. So I thank both of you for coming out. I thank our earlier guest and mayor, as always, it's a pleasure. So tune in for our next show and see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.